All right. Well, welcome to today's uh, weekly training. As you can see on the screen, it's been a crazy year, right? We've had everything from murder hornets to flame throwing squirrels. So, uh, and, and the anxiety that I think many agents are feeling is, is only amplified in consumers because consumers aren't getting the facts, right? So uh, I saw an ad actually just a couple of days ago that was uh, Redfin and Redfin did this ad. It had a really somber tone and it was like, even in this market, some people are buying and selling homes. And I thought to myself, I'm gonna do a spoof video on that because that's idiotic. This market is white hot. And they're talking about even in this market. In this market, are you kidding me? I was gonna say, you know, I don't wanna name names, but a company that rhymes with dead spin, something like that. Anyway, let's talk about it. You guys uh, all work too hard to not be able to impart confidence and education on your clients. Uh, so we're gonna to talk today about, you know, what's been going on. I mean, look at that, we've had double hurricanes and 85 straight days of riots just in the last week. People are scared, right? And, it, and there's an enormous amount of uncertainty. I did a training in April called Be Certainty in a Time of Uncertainty and Truer words have never been spoken. This is a time for you to be a point of certainty for your clients, right? So think about it. How do you think your clients are feeling? They get all this bombarded news hammering them 24 seven from their phones, from their TVs, from their peer groups, social media, you name it. And they don't know what to believe. They don't know what's true, what's not true. They, they know that they either are thinking about selling or buying, or they need to sell or buy, and they're paralyzed with fear, right? That's a really common uh, circumstance for people, and you can help, and that should be pretty empowering, right? So we're gonna today talk about what's been going on. We're gonna talk about where are we right now, and what you should do about that. And then we're also gonna talk a little bit about where it's going. And then I'm gonna give you a little bonus uh, training at the end about, uh, how I do our market update videos. I've been doing every month for four years now. And I get a ton of engagement. I get a ton of, I literally today, I had lunch with somebody and she said, uh, when we first like got out of our cars and started walking towards each other, she said, guess what I did just now? And I go, what? She said, I watched your market update video because I released one yesterday. It's, it's a really great way for you to be in front of your clients, in front of your sphere of influence, reminding them that you're an expert. And the number one way to convey competence is to use data and statistics. There's a big difference between saying the market's great and we are up 12.8% since last year. Did you know that? 12.8% appreciation since this time last year. Just a vastly different level of credibility in both those statements, right? Both of them are accurate, but which one is more persuasive, right? Especially when you think about what did the experts predict for appreciation this year? Myself included. We all thought 5% appreciation. We thought the markets were gonna cool, we were gonna head into a recession. We didn't even know about the pandemic at the time. Then the pandemic hits and it accelerates the markets, right? But a, a consumer left not, you know, left unadvised, they're gonna assume the worst. It's human nature, right? It's just like when you have kids, if you don't hear from them, you assume they're in a ditch, right? That's human nature. So what do you, what do you guys think has been happening? You think the market's strong or weak? I probably ruined this point by just telling you that it's up 12.8%. Um, that's actually on average, 13.6% for single families. So yeah, the market is strong. How about since the pandemic started, did it get hotter, cooler? These are all things you should be able to answer, right? I have a double slide here. 
How about inventory? What do you think inventory's done? Scott, you think it's gone up? Nothing but down. I'm with you, man. I thought it was going to go up too. Right? You have low inventory. You're not allowed to have showings. Remember, initially, we were non-essential. No showings at all. Thankfully, that only lasts about 24 hours. But even after we came out of the 24 hours, you still were only allowed to show one person at a time. So one spouse would have to sit in the car while the other spouse looked at the property. Those are all reasons to assume that homes are going to start to slow down. The velocity is going to start to slow down. But, but look at the screen. Went from almost two months down to basically one month. 1 1.04. That's 32 days of inventory. And remember what a balanced market is, right? Balanced market is six months of inventory. They're even softening on that definition. Now they say four to six months. It's all for 50 years, it's been six months. And we have not even six weeks. We have four weeks, right? How about interest rates? That's right, they've gone down. They've gone down to historical lows. They were already awesome. Three and a quarter? Are you kidding me? And now we're under three. We're in the twos. We're going to talk in a second, but guess what that causes buyers to do, right? They come out of the woodwork. Did you know purchase money transaction applications, purchase money loan applications, are up 22% over last year? 22%. And last year was a hot market without a pandemic. But yet there's 22% more people trying to buy right now. It's because of these rates, right? How about pendings and sold? What do you think those have done? We've been in lockdown now. March 25th, right, was the beginning of the lockdown. March 25th, the average, daily average of pendings for the week of March 25th, so that would have been pre-lockdown, was 132 deals a day going into escrow. Now, granted, even before we were in lockdown, the anxiety about the virus was already rampant, and we were all anticipating a lockdown, right? And so it caused buyers and sellers to start to get a little jittery. But look at that, 132 rose to 258, it doubled in four weeks. And then went up another 70, another 20, another 40. Nothing but up, 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 up. And the solds, exact same thing. When that uncertainty happened, right? Then people started to get clarity about, is it gonna have an effect on lending, on recordings, on showings, on all of the different, I mean, Think about it, NAR says there's 181 steps in a transaction, 181. How many of those steps would be affected by a quarantine? Pretty much all of them, right? At least initially, until people figure out, oh, I can underwrite loans from home. I can write offers from home. I can even negotiate from home, right? But there was that learning curve. We all went through it, but we're doing a Zoom meeting right now. Right? The cool thing is you work for a firm that's so technologically inclined. We started doing success hours over Zoom four years ago. Did you realize that? Before many of you even joined the firm, we were doing Zoom meetings. We didn't need we don't need no stinking pandemic, right? So how would you describe what's been happening to your clients? Because all of you have already either already heard we're going to be asked, what does all this mean? What does the pandemic mean? What does the lack of a vaccine mean? What does the recession mean? What does the election mean? They, they all want to know, right? And they all look to us as experts. Uh, I had a, uh, a comment on one of my YouTube videos from a guy in Florida. What's, the, what's coronavirus doing to your market, right? People want to know. So you have to have an answer. I'm going to share with you my answer, okay? 
What I say is, hey, you know what? That's a great question. And I can tell you the impact of the pandemic and the quarantine literally only lasted about 10 days. The market activity fell 30% over those 10 days. And that was in part due to the lack of clarity of what was going to be allowed. Like a lot of people don't realize that we were non-essential for 24 hours and then we became essential, right? So lack of clarity about what was allowed. What followed was a 41% increase that took us right back to and above where we were. That's specific statistical data that is easier for a consumer to digest and also to understand, right? Because look, like we were just looking at, right? 132 pendings a day rose to almost 400. That's blowing past where we were. Make sense? All right, let's press on. Last year through July, we all, the entire MLS, put 50,643 homes in escrow through seven months. Where do you think we are this year compared to last year? Ahead. <laughs> I, I like it. I like your, your attitude, right? No, actually we're behind, right? Which probably doesn't surprise a lot of people. But here's what's interesting. We're behind by 3,200 homes as compared to last year. April by itself was 3,000 plus homes behind April of 2019. So it's almost just April that put us behind and the, the other six months have been fairly even. In fact, three of the other six months, we've outsold 2019. And one of those months is during the pandemic. So velocity is, is with us, right? These are powerful statistics. So remember, shoot a, shoot a picture of that screen, right? Consumers want to know. And if all you told them was we're behind last year by 3,000, that's going to cause a seller to think, oh, I should wait. But if you point out that, no, April was 3,000 by itself, right? So where are we at today, right? What is the market doing today? Well, we know we have historically low rates. We've had historically low rates for almost three years now. We have rates that we've never seen before right now. Like this is historical with an exclamation point, which means it's a great time to buy, right? Historically low inventory means it's a great time to sell. You have less competition and you have low rates, which means buyers have more buying power, right? Purchase money loan applications are up 22%. That's good for both buyers and sellers, right? Sellers feel like, yeah, there's a boatload of buyers coming through. I'm gonna take advantage of that. And I got low inventory to compete with. I'm an idiot if I don't take advantage of it. The video I just dropped yesterday is my market update video. You know what it's entitled? Why this September will be the best September in decades to sell your home. I encourage all of you to watch it because in it, I talk about the top four reasons why this September is gonna be awesome. And remember, most people think, ah, man, September, I've already missed it. The selling season's over, school started, right? No way, not this year. And the gal I mentioned a second ago that watched my video, I asked her, I said, what do you think about my hypothesis for September? She said, I think you are right on. You're exactly, you're predicting exactly what the market's gonna do. Does that make me a more attractive agent for a per prospective seller or buyer than somebody who just got in the business or doesn't know about the market, right? That's why I'm sharing this with you guys. I want it jammed into your head, right? You guys study this stuff every day. You train on it every day. You know how to win, right, in this environment. 
If you haven't watched it, you need to watch the writing winning offers video. There's actually two of them, three if you count how to win writing offers on foreclosure. If you have seen them, watch them again. As a firm, we sold 36 houses last year, 2019, where we were not the highest bidder. And the reason is people used the writing winning offers techniques and people followed our offer writing process. There's a video on that too. We, we butter up the listing broker, we glean all the information we can, we make sure our offer is as compelling as it can be. You guys heard Jason say a second ago that uh, his buyers were capped, but they made everything else as strong as they could. Their pre-approval is the only reason they couldn't go any higher and they still won, right? It even includes buyer love letters. Why do you think we have three or four template buyer love letters in the software in V4? Because they work. Only once in my career have I had a listing broker say, um, oh, it's a fair housing violation for me to even show this letter to the seller. That guy's an idiot. He doesn't know how to help people win. All right, I'm, I'm getting fired up, can you tell? All right, so where's the market gonna go, All right? Well, number one, rates stay low in a recession every time. In fact, rates start to climb when the recovery has started. That's your first indicator that, that the recession is coming to an end. Because remember, the number one tool that the Fed has to combat inflation is rates, right? We don't want you to have to pay $21 a pound for ground beef. So rates are gonna stay low, I think deep into next year, maybe even 2022. Appreciation, however, is gonna continue. And that's a really important thing to know and understand because you're gonna have buyers who think, oh man, we're in a recession, there's gonna be foreclosures, and, and so rate or uh, values are gonna decline. So if I just wait, I'm gonna get a better deal. They're wrong. If you wanna understand what's gonna happen due to the pandemic, due to the moratoriums on foreclosure, due to forbearance, all those things, watch my July um, market update video. Go to my YouTube channel, watch the one with the little cartoon guy sitting in the Adirondack chair. That's what the thumbnail looks like. Because in it, I talk about the three things that I can guarantee are gonna happen in the coming 12 months. And they have a lot to do with uh, foreclosures. And you guys all know that the, the volume of foreclosures we had in 07, 08 were a big part of why values declined 30%. And consumers, I, I don't blame them, right? But when's the last time we had triple digit um, movement in the Dow, right? Stocks were going up hundreds of points, down hundreds of points. The last time that happened was 07, 08. So when people saw that happen in April of this year, they thought, oh man, we're going back to 07, 08, and that means I'm gonna lose 30% of my equity in my home. That's not true. You can look at, I have a video from April where you'll see me talking about the fundamental reasons why this economy is different from that economy. I won't bore you with it right now, but it comes down to the fact that we had eight months of inventory back then, we have one right now. Interest rates were really high back then. We have historically low rates right now. Homeowner equity was at record lows back then. It's at record highs right now. And then the fourth reason is you, we learned a ton going through that recession and we know how to fix things and we will recover from this recession a lot faster. And because we're starting at one month of inventory, we, we will never go negative, right? There will be some neighborhoods, mostly high-end neighborhoods, where depreciation will happen. But between 300,000 and 800,000, it's not gonna happen, even 900,000. Right, so appreciation is going to remain strong because even if we get a flood of foreclosures, we're, we're going to go from one month of inventory to two or three, still in a 
extreme seller's market, right? Inventory is going to stay low for years, right? It's going to stay under six months, which is where you'd need to be to see depreciation for years, right? Do you remember why? Another thing I covered in a recent video, right? Birth rates. Uh, Adrian's company put on an event, they put it on every year with Barry Habib. The guy is phenomenal. He's an economist and he's, he's won the uh, Crystal Ball Award for predicting mortgage rates like three of the last five years or two of the last four. I think it might be two of the last four. In his presentation in March, I think it was March, we talked about birth rates. So look on the screen, what you're looking at is from 1980 to 1991, they did nothing but climb. And from 91 to 95, they still stayed above two, uh, 2%, two right? So when you have rising birth rates back at this time frame, the reason this time frame is so important is because the average first time home buyer is 34 years old. And think about the average home or first time home buyers, not the average, but all of them. First time home buyers are taking and not giving. By that I mean, like I own a home. If I were to move, I'm gonna take one home and return it to the inventory. And then I'm gonna buy a new one and take it from the inventory. And that's a net neutral effect on inventory. But first time home buyers, they don't have a home to sell. So they're just taking, right? So you have this pressure on the inventory that's only going to continue to rise, right? 1986 was 34 years ago. But look at the next four years and even up to nine total years. It's doing nothing but climb. So that means there's going to be more first time home buyers next year than there were this year. And there's going to be more first time home buyers the following year than there is next year, and so on, right? And also, this is all compounded by the fact that it's a, there's an estimated 300,000 home shortfall. So our inventory is low, but we are also underbuilding new homes to the tune of 300,000 homes a year to keep up, right? And that's because the builders, they took it in the shorts, 07, 08. They were building homes like crazy. They were keeping up with the demand. They were anticipating the demand. And then all of a sudden the demand left, right? The Great Recession caused the demand to disappear. Well, now you got rising first time home buyer numbers and a shortfall. Over these next four years, you're going to have a million two shortfall. And you're have nothing but more and more first time home buyers coming into the market. Right? So what does all this mean? It means we're going to have low inventory for a while, right? As much as nine years. And I say as much as because nine years is a long time, right? Builders can all of a sudden kick it in gear. We can have some other event. Thankfully, the pandemic is the type of event that would cause a, a recession, but it didn't cause the, the housing crash right? That happened in 07, 08. That was caused, that was self-inflicted. Lenders were idiots, right? Buyers were idiots. I had a, I had a client, I'll give you a, a real short example of the poster child for the Great Recession. I got a, a foreclosure assignment from a company called IndyMac. Some of you that have been around for a while will probably remember IndyMac, right? They were owned by One West Bank, which was owned by George Soros. Hey, look at that. So IndyMac assigns me this foreclosure, and it is a monstrosity in SeaTac. So it's this neighborhood in SeaTac where it's all 1970s Ramblers, and then there's this giant pink stucco two-story mansion, and it got foreclosed. So I go into this house. I'm shooting photos, doing occupancy check. It looks like basically they moved out. There's some stuff left behind, but it's all the furniture's gone. And also this guy walks in, right? And I go, oh, are you the former owner? And that's just an instinct, right? I always say the former owner because it puts people sort of 
on their heels and it did with this guy and he because they never thought of themselves as former anything right so he goes well yeah this is my house and i said well you might not realize it but actually it got foreclosed last week so the property now belongs to the bank but i can help you get some relocation assistance if you want so anyway that's how i keep things friendly right so we have this long conversation i figure out that this guy uh, was a TSA employee. He lives in SeaTac. He works at the airport. So he's making 15 bucks an hour. He borrows a million dollar construction loan to build an overbuilt house in SeaTac. And then can't afford the payments. Imagine that, right? So I walked out of the house thinking, man, this guy is the poster child for this recession. But more importantly, the appraiser was an idiot. The underwriter was an idiot. The borrower, this guy was an idiot. The securitizers and credit enhancers, they were all idiots. This loan should never have been made. And look at what happened, right? We don't have that kind of stupidity going on now. Stated income construction loans, give me a break. Anyway, so, Knowing all this about inventory, the lack of inventory, the increase in first time home buyers, what do you think your clients should do? Well, if they're buyers, they need to get going, right? You need to be able to, excuse me, you need to be able to communicate to a buyer that waiting is only going to make it more expensive, right? These low rates are not going to be around forever. And hopefully, I've shown you why depreciation isn't going to be in the future, isn't coming. So what are you waiting for, right? Every day that goes by, that home costs you more money. Now, having said all that, if there's a reason they can't buy, don't discourage them. There's people that'll think, oh man, I missed it, right? Tell them, yeah, well, there's people that bought homes in the 80s wishing they had bought them sooner. And how do you think they're making out right now? Right, this is gonna be the same case here, but it is great today. And if you can do it sooner rather than later, you're, you're gonna be better off. Sellers, same, same thing, sooner is better than later, but the reasoning is a little different. With sellers, the further you go out into the future, the greater the risk of something happening or, or the market changing, right? We're already in a recession. We're in a very unique position because in this recession, we still have appreciation and we have historically low interest rate. So as a seller, I can put my home on the market, I can get multiple offers, and I've got buyers who are more willing to bid aggressively because the cost of funds is so cheap for them. A buyer paying 40 grand over asking price when their interest rate is 2.9, doesn't sting as much as paying 40 grand when their rate is six, right? So buyers you'll find will be more aggressive because they feel more empowered by the low interest rates. Sellers should take advantage of that. These are all part of the reasons why I say September is gonna be the best September in years, right? Low rates equals buying power. So what should you guys do? Now you got all this information in your head, right? What should you do with it? Don't just wait for people to ask you, right? Promote it, spread the word, get on social media. If any of these statistics resonated with you, post them, tweet them, right? Make market update videos. Make every video you can. If you're not comfortable on video, do it anyway. You don't have a choice, okay? Bottom line, I'm terrible on video, but I'm super comfortable on video because I've been doing it for a long time. I hated it at the beginning. I thought my voice sounded weird, certainly look weird, right? Just do it. When you do one, the next one's easier. I had a, a one of the REO networks I'm in, there's a gal in Connecticut. She, she and I had this specific conversation. She was paralyzed with fear. I said, your number one thing to do as soon as we hang up is shoot a video and send it to me. I'm not gonna post it. 
I'm the only one that's going to see it. Just go walk your neighborhood. Tell me about your neighborhood. And she did. And you know what I didn't know is she was in the Hamptons. She was walking the beach. It was awesome. It was windy, but I was like, texted her back. I'm like, that was a great video, right? So every video will get easier than the last. Just get out and do it, all right? And do market update videos. I'm not kidding when I say I get great engagement, and it's Blake's fault that I get great engagement because he makes me look good, right? If you aren't aware or you haven't seen it, we have a green room here, right? We have the green screen, we got the lighting, we got everything you need here in the office. It's even got a teleprompter, right? Look, you can see right there, it's time for another Northwest market update, and you are gonna love this one. And then I'm going to explain why this September will be the best September in decades if you're thinking about selling your home. Blah, blah, blah. I love it, Blake. That's literally the script I wrote, and I haven't even sent it to him. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks, Blake. Right? So teleprompter, lighting, you just stand up there and read it. You can use my script. You can use Scott's script. You can write your own. I know Janice has taken both our scripts and pulled things that she liked from both of them and made her own. We want you to plagiarize to your heart's content, but do something, right? Because you will drive engagement with it and you will strike conversations. And in the end, you're gonna have people recognizing you as an expert. We had uh, friends over for dinner last night and uh, the wife said, you've been busy. And I said, well, yeah, it's, it's a good market. She thought I was busy, not because I post just listed, just sold. She thought I was busy because I post. That's it. And that's what I want, right? I want people to think of me when they think of real estate. So take advantage of the green room, start writing your own scripts or use ours. I don't, we don't care, do something. Or like the last couple I've done, I actually shot them in my neighborhood, shot one in my backyard. If you go watch the July one, you'll see I'm sitting in a Adirondack chair in my backyard. Do something, right? Take this knowledge, share it with people, apply it in your business, and win. That's what we want for you. I hope you found this helpful.